Welcome back to Music 239, Introduction to World Music. Today we have a very special day because we are going to make a Native American water drum and uh, the class is going to assist in that process. What we have is an earthen pot that was actually created by uh, a, uh, an artist here at Missouri State University, a student, uh, and it was, I purchased it at the pot, pottery sale that they have over in the student union, um, over in the student union every uh, spring and every fall, so particularly for this purpose. We have a sheepskin chamois purchased at an auto parts store. We have a stick from, uh, the, from, a, from a tree right outside this building. And we have a piece of, of rawhide that can be used for tying the chamois skin onto the top of the drum once the water is in it. So let's have some volunteers to actually make the drum, okay? Okay, two gentlemen in the back here are going to volunteer to do that. Chris and Ryan, come on, come on up. You're going to make a water drum. Now the first thing that needs to happen is the water needs to go in the drum. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, and I think we might need a little more, so let's, uh, let's have somebody go get some. And Larry, you're going to go get some water for us? Thank you very much. Okay, while she's doing that, <coughs> let me explain a little bit about the process of what's going to happen. Uh, the reason that I'm having two people do this is because one person is going to need to make sure that the chamois is as tight as possible over the top of the pot so that we can get a really nice tight drum head and then hold that down while the other person ties the, the cord around it. And it's rawhide, so it's going to be best if we can actually get that wet before we do it. And the same with the chamois. It's going to work best if we, can, uh, if we can soak it just a little bit because it'll stretch a little bit better for us and uh, ultimately be a lot easier to put together. Okay, so that's, that's a, a very important step. You don't want to have it be absolutely sopping wet because you do eventually want it to dry somewhat. But the people who play these instruments tend to occasionally, if, it, if the skin is drying out, they take the water drum and turn it upside down and wet the membrane again so that they can get that distinctive kind of sound that they're trying to get, which is the whole reason of having a water drum in the first place. Come on up and, and, and pour the rest of that water in for us. All right, very good. Now, this is probably soaked long enough, so Let's take that off, and um, Chris, let's have you stretch the membrane over the top of the pot, okay, and try to, try to get around it and hold it in fast as much as you can. And then Ryan is going to go ahead and tie it and use some kind of a bow or something so that it's easy to untie afterwards. Okay. Good, good. And now you find that you can, um, you've got, okay, a bit of a, a bit of tension there. You can actually increase the tension a little bit by pulling the sides under the tie, bit and increasing even more, so that. the sound that we get tends to gain resonance as, uh, as, you, as you tighten it down a little bit. So you want to get to that optimum tightness and tension on the drum head. Hear the difference in the resonance there? And, and you have to find just the right place on the head of the drum 
to get that. I'm going to put that up close to the microphone here, so... And you can experiment with places. You can hear quite a bit more resonance because of the water in the drum and because of the cavity underneath it as you start to work with it. And then you can, if you're not getting quite enough, you can, you can get it a little wetter, okay, uh, and try not to spill a whole lot while you're doing it and see if that helps you. See if it changes the sound. Uh, the players of water drums are very particular about it and they, they like the sound that they get when it's a particular kind of wetness, particular type of tension. It's a very specific kind of thing. Okay, uh, so you gentlemen are done. Thank you very much for your work on this. You made a nice water drum. Now we're going to have a percussion rehearsal and performance. So uh, we need a couple other volunteers to play the water drum and to play the rattle. Okay, Andy and uh, and, and uh, Jonathan are, are volunteering. Come on up. Come on up. Very good of you to volunteer like this. Um, who wants to play the rattle? Okay, Andy's going to play the rattle. This rattle, uh, hold it up, Andy, and let's take a look at it. It's made of a turtle shell, and it's also got uh, some decorative kinds of uh, beads and things. It also has jingling bells on it, right? So, uh, so, so you've got uh, the, and then there's a skin around the back that holds the whole thing in place. It's a very traditional kind of ceremonial rattle. The water drum player is going to be Jonathan. You want to give that a try and see, uh, give, give that a try, see how it goes? Yeah, you better play with that end. I'd turn it over, I'd turn it over so that you, because you've got a curvature here and I would, I would curve it down towards the drum. Okay, okay. Now, let's, let's have the, the rattle and the, let's have the rattle and the water drum play together. Dun, 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 About that eighth note. Okay, good, good. Now, one thing, Jonathan, as you're playing that I notice is that you're sort of accenting the first of two pulses and making the second one not quite so accented. That's not typical of Native American music. Uh, and and uh, as Randy Falcon will tell you when he does his presentation at our next session, uh, the, the, the movies where you hear the drummers going boom, 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 right? Putting an accent on that first one doesn't happen. That's in the movies, okay? <laughs> That's in the movies. Uh, the, the, the true Native American style that you hear on recordings of traditional players, uh, all the pulses are equal. And, and the reason is that, uh, particularly in, in the cases of the big drum, it represents a heartbeat. Okay. So uh, in this case, I think you want to keep all of your pulses uh, pretty much the same. Let's, uh, let's stretch the membrane just a tad here and try that again. Okay. There you go. Together. Good, good. Okay. Here's our percussion section. They're ready to go. Now we need to have a choir rehearsal. So if you will turn in your books to the section on the Navajo peyote song, Hymn of the Native American Church, Okay, we're going to start on the pitch A that is given in the transcription. Okay, and we sing this music three times. Okay, these are vocables, right? So they, uh, they, they don't have a particular meaning in terms of the language, but uh, as the text points out, it's part of this particular uh, Native American church ritual and is almost like an amen, as, uh, as, as one of you pointed out in our last session. Okay? So uh, it actually says repeat four times, so we're going to do that eventually as we practice it. But right now, let's just practice it one time through and see how we do. Okay, hey, yo, way, no, way, nu, na. Ready? Two, three, four. 
And so on. Right. Very good. Very good. You guys are good sight readers. Very good. Now, we're going to put this together. And how do we do it? Well, we all start together, but as we've discussed in our last session, the drums and the rattle do not stay together with the vocalist. So, in order to reproduce what's on the recording here, you guys need to go a little faster than what we're doing. Say, I'm going to conduct the choir. You guys are on your own, but you need to stay together, okay? <laughs> you think you can do that? Okay, let's give it a try and see what happens. One, two, So uh, now that we've done our performance of the hymn to the Native American church, let's go back and listen to the real original and see how we did. Compare and contrast. <laughs> How did we do? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the vocals are faster too. Yeah, we, we slowed it down a little bit because uh, we haven't been doing this all our lives like, uh, like, like the singer that you hear on the recording. So uh, we, we, we slowed it down a little bit to make it a little easier for us, okay? 
Good. Anything else? Right, right. His voice tends to slide between the pitches a little bit more, and he's a little more free about it than we are because I was conducting you all, which try, try, try to keep you all in the same tempo. He's just a single singer, and so he can kind of take some liberties a little bit. Plus, it, it, he's much more chant-like. Uh, it's, it's more like a chant, an incantation almost for him than it is singing in a very metric kind of style as, as we did when we performed it. Yet, I think our performance does give us a real perspective on this music and, and how it's performed. And think about how much better you know this particular piece now than, say, Yebache or Shizane A, the other tunes that we studied in the previous session. Because you've performed it, you've been involved in a performance of it, you have so much more insight now into this particular piece of music than you did before you, you did that. So as relating that to your final projects that you all should be already thinking about, uh, think about how much better you would understand a music culture if you were able to participate in it somehow. Do you see what I mean? That whole issue of participation can be such an important thing. And if you have an opportunity to somehow sit in with the music culture that you're going to study, that makes it so much better and you gain so much more insight into it by doing that. And here's a, just a small example of how that can happen. So our rattle and our water drum players did a nice job. And putting it all together uh, was, uh, was well done in this class. So congratulations on your work. Now, we need to move on now to look at some additional music that is under the general category of newer Navajo music found in your text. And you'll find all of these on the CD. And I hope you will take the opportunity to listen to all of them as, uh, in, in their entirety, because we're not going to listen to all of them in class, but I will be playing excerpts from them and discussing them at this time. The Chinle Galileans do a performance of Clinging to a Saving Hand, which is a uh, evangelical Christianity-based music. Uh, and in the performance you have on your CD, uh, the the uh, the style, uh, the particularly the country style, comes through in quite a strong way. See if you can listen to this and hear Navajo characteristics or Native American characteristics as we as we've been studying them. This is track 11 on the CD. <laughs> Navajo characteristics, Native American characteristics here? Not really, not very many. In this case, it's an all Navajo group, but they have completely assimilated the style of the, the country music from which this song is based. The only thing that gives it away as being Navajo performers, according to your text, is the accents of the singers. That's it. Everything else is completely assimilated from another culture. So in this case, they have completely adopted a, an additional culture, and there is virtually no Navajo influence at all. That's not the case with some of the other pieces that are 
uh, in your text in this unit. I want to go next to uh, Folsom Prison Blues by the Fenders. Okay, that is CD one track seven. Listen to a bit of this. <laughs> Who did the original of this song? Johnny Cash. Right. And so, are you familiar with the Johnny Cash version of this? Okay, so and stylistically that would qualify as what type of music? Country. Probably country, I think. Yeah, Johnny Cash is pretty much in the country category. Some crossover kinds of things, but, but generally country. So just like the song that we heard before, Clinging to a Saving Hand, okay, the, the Navajo performers in this all Navajo band have assimilated a country music style, but there is something distinctly Navajo about this performance. Does anybody know what it is? Pentatonic scale? Pentatonic scale? No, not necessarily. I think, I think they're, they're pretty true to the original in terms of the scale form that's used, and it's, not, it's, it's, more, of a, it's more of a major um, a seven note major scale rather than pentatonic. Falsetto? Falsetto? No, there's no falsetto. Percussion? Okay, sure. Yeah, you could you could certainly say the use of percussion here would would be one of those categories. But I'm not thinking of those 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 characteristics that we've looked at before so much as I'm thinking about the uh, the the thing I said about Navajo people being creative, and about them uh, not necessarily having their percussion line up specifically with what the vocals are doing. What I want you to do this time is. Get your conducting sticks out, okay? I know you don't have conducting sticks, but pretend you have one. Your conductors, everybody's, everybody's going to learn to conduct right now, and you're going to go down, left, right, up. Down, left, right, up. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And we're going to conduct along with Folsom Prison Blues and see if one is always falling in the same place. Here's one, one, one. Uh oh, what happened? One, one. We are in the wrong place. Our ones got off somehow from where one in the music is. How did that happen? Yeah, or, or, or even a 3-4. They, they left out beats in some cases, and they added beats in other cases in the breaks in between where the vocals are, okay? So that there's not quite enough beats in there when they come back in. Can they just not count? Is that the problem? Or is it a problem? They sound fine. They sound fine, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Take a look in your books where it talks about shortcuts in Navajo music. This is right after the discussion of clinging to a saving hand. It says, 
the clues that the performers are Navajos are the singer's Navajo accent and, in the case of the Fender's CD selection, certain melodic and rhythmic shortcuts compared to the Anglo original. This is what appeals to Navajo listeners and makes them feel that the performing groups are somehow their own. That creativity then, particularly in how the rhythm relates to the melody, is particularly Navajo and it's what makes this version of the uh, Johnny Cash standard specifically Navajo in terms of how they leave those beats out. They're not doing it by accident. It's not that they can't count. It's just that they've decided that they want to take those shortcuts and make it their own. So there is a very interesting uh, version of an assimilation, assimilation of culture where we have the traditional and the, the more modern mass media effect coming together in a unique version of Folsom Prison Blues. Does that make sense? You understand how this is working and, and why it is? Let's listen to it once again. See if we hear where those beats are left out. We're still okay here. Now listen to what happens here. One. <laughs> they stuck an extra beat in that measure. And they did it again there. If you go through that whole song on your own and try to figure out where one is, you're going to have to add extra beats to some of the measures in order to have that happen. And that's what's so interesting to the Navajo listener and, and the reason that they, they do this in this particular recording. Now, there are several other pieces on your CD of Native American music, uh, particularly Navajo music, that are influenced by more modern styles. The Native American flute revival, for example, is a major major movement in the United States and you hear a lot of performances. Uh, Carlos Nakai is probably the most famous of the performers who do this and you're going to hear Randy Falcon doing some flute performances in our next session. Uh, the, uh, the very interesting thing about this particular performance that is on your CD is that the synthesizers that are providing the soundscape for the flute are not quite in tune with the flute in certain cases. Have you listened to this recording yet? Somebody listen to it? Let's, let's listen to a bit of it. Did you listen to it? Did you notice the intonation issues? Yeah, it's almost painful to our ears, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think he's just not playing in tune? Let's listen and, and, and see what we, uh, what we think about this. This is CD1 track 14. It goes on for quite some time. Do you think they just not know how to tune the synthesizer to the flute? What is the issue? What do you think? Hmm. So because one is made of wood and the other one is essentially an electrophone, um, they, they, can't, they can't have a meeting of the, of the minds? 
Right, right. You make a very good point. <clears throat> the synthesizer is tuned to a Western 12-note scale like we saw in, in class during the first session. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so uh, the flute, the Native American flute, is not necessarily tuned to that Western tuning at all. And so when you put those two together, you have essentially a clash of cultures. And in assimilating this style, right, this, this synthesizer, in with the Native American flute, what you have is a combination of two things that are not capable of playing exactly in tune with each other. The other thing is that as you listen to other types of Native American music, particularly when they're all singing together, uh, I'm not sure that intonation in a Western sense, the sense that we would experience it, is something that is a priority to the Native American performers at all. In fact, they may like that sound. We're going to run into some other cultures as, we, as this course continues, uh, particularly in Indonesia and also in Bosnia, in Eastern Europe, we're going to run into cultures in which that clash of very close harmonies, very close sounds like that, which tends to make our ears cringe a little bit, is actually something that is preferred by the culture and they really like. And so uh, you, you, you must, must not judge this culture based on our own standards and say, well, the flute player is out of tune. Well, yes, in our standard but by their standard, not necessarily. And so these are all excellent points. Uh, and it is possible to tune a synthesizer a little bit. You can, you can raise or lower the pitch of the whole thing. But what you can't do is make it match up exactly with what the Native American flute is playing because of the fact that it is not playing in the same kind of tuning. We will look at this more specifically when we study Bosnian music and also uh, Indonesian music, and we'll look at some graphs and charts that show specifically what I'm talking about in terms of non-Western tuning systems. Any other questions about this particular piece before we move on? Okay, we have two or three more pieces to talk about. New composers in traditional modes. Okay. Um, example 12 on CD number one is a performance by Sharon Birch uh, entitled Mother Earth. And it particularly emphasizes the Native American tendency to be close to nature. Remember in our last session when we looked at the enemy way and the shooting way ceremonies, and particularly in Shooting Way, we discovered that there was an attempt to create a closeness to nature. Uh, somebody had fallen into disharmony with nature, and so a Shooting Way was performed for someone who received a snake bite. In this song by Sharon Birch, she's taken a fairly Western version of a song and attached some fairly Native American type of text to it. And you can look in your textbook and find the translation of the text that she sings in Mother Earth. Everything brings happiness. Everything brings happiness. I am part of Mother Earth. Mother Earth's feet are my feet. Mother Earth's legs are my legs, and so on. This is track 12 on your CD. A fairly Western guitar accompaniment to this song, but the text is all clearly Navajo and the subject matter is very, very Native American. What other characteristics of Native American vocal music do you find in this song? 
Remember our characteristics? Vocables. Vocables. Absolutely. Hey ya. The first syllable she sings. All right? And then she goes into the actual text. Mm -hmm. Vocables are there. What else? Repetitive. Repetitive. Absolutely. Pentatonic. Melody. Uh huh. Monophonic. Monophonic singing. Mm -hmm. Descending small notes, note values. Yeah, yeah, we get a lot of that. Uh, so we see some of those characteristics that we've seen in Native American music all through this unit brought through into a fairly modern sounding composition and a very attractive piece. Okay. Um, the next one to uh, number 13, Proud Earth. You'll find a description of that one in your text. This one is heavily influenced by Mormon belief. Uh, the composer of this song was a student at Brigham Young and is also a Mormon. And so you see some of the Mormon beliefs represented in this music. And you also have a, um, a situation where they brought in an actor, uh, the late uh, Dan George, who was a uh, famous Native American actor, uh, to do the narration underneath the singing. And once again, nature is a very important element here. <laughs> The beat of my heart is kept alive in my drum, and my plight echoes in the canyons, the meadows, and the plains, and my laughter runs free with the deer. Tears fall with the rain, but my soul knows no pain. What Native American characteristics do we hear in this performance? I'm sorry? Call and response. That's an interesting concept. Uh, almost as if the speaker is responding to the singer, or vice versa. Yes, very, very good. Sorry? Use of percussion. Use of percussion with the singer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, is the percussion together with the singer? With the singer, but not the speaker. With the singer, but not the, but not the speaker. Yeah, OK. Very good. What else? Any vocables here? No, no vocables. I'm sorry? OK. Monophonic singing, certainly monophonic singing in this case. Call and response, I think, is an excellent way of looking at this, though, uh, in terms of the way that the speaker is used uh, to respond and echo what the singer is doing. And of course, the text is very Native American in terms of being at one with nature. Mother Earth is at my feet. And then the Mormon influence, and my God is up above me. So we have a combination of the Native American essentially feeling a strong connection with nature and the Mormon feeling the connection with God and putting those two together in an interesting kind of symbiotic relationship between two cultures. So I, I hope that in all of this newer Native American music, you can see that we have two cultures blending in interesting and unpredictable kinds of ways. Right? In clinging to a saving hand, in that case, the Navajo have completely accepted the country music style and very little remains. In the, uh, in the Folsom Prison Blues, very much a country song, and yet there are those Navajo rhythmic elements of leaving, or leaving beats out or adding beats in to create an unpredictability about where the downbeat is. 
In the flute music, we have the intonation issues that turn out to be something that is unavoidable considering the number, the different instruments that are being involved here. And then the last two pieces, the new traditional composers in traditional modes where we've heard uh, both Sharon Birch and the Mormon influence on Proud Earth. So a lot of the uh, Native American uh, assimilating the more traditional style. Are there any other questions today regarding Native American music in general? Okay. Our very next session will feature Randy Falcon, who is a fabulous Native American performer. He'll have drums, he'll have Native American flute, and he'll be doing some singing as well, and quite a bit of talking about the Native American music which he performs. Anybody here tell me what a powwow is? A powwow, not a cowbell. <laughs> yes? It literally means like a sit down and meeting, and it's what it is where a bunch of um, Native Americans come, they meet gather together and they sell and they show off their traditions. Okay, okay. Powwow means Native Americans getting together and sitting down and showing off their traditions. So the key element is that it is multi-tribal. A powwow is multi-tribal. And there are opportunities around this area for you to attend powwows if that is something you would like to go to. Occasionally they have them up at the fairgrounds here uh, in, in Springfield, the uh, Ozark Empire Fairgrounds. Uh, you can also go to a number of powwows in Oklahoma. Uh, so if that is something that interests you, please see me about it and I can uh, put you in touch with that. Okay. As you prepare for the next couple of sessions, uh, it would be good to look ahead to, the, to chapter three on African music. Okay? Uh, begin to listen to the music associated with that chapter. Uh, please come to class having read the chapter or at least skimmed it. I know some of them are a little long. Please at least skim the chapter and also listen to all of the music associated with that chapter. It will be of great benefit if you can do that. We'll see you next time. Please be here for Randy Falcon. You don't want to miss him. See you then. <laughs>